We gather here each and every Sunday primarily to pledge our allegiance to Christ and to his kingdom. And we gather here as a community, not united by our country or our color or our culture, but united by a story. And it's a story that we call the gospel, the good news, the proclamation that in Jesus Christ, that God himself has broken into human history and joined himself to humanity, suffered and died for our sin, victoriously risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, inaugurating God's kingdom reign on earth and launching a cosmic revolution to make all things new, including you and me. And when we hear and believe this good news, confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of our sin, and trusting in the person of work of Christ, we understand that that restorative power of God begins to come upon us. And we're adopted by the Father and united with Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, and empowered to joyfully participate in the life of the divine and to join Jesus in the reconciliation of all things. This is the gospel. This is the story that unites us here today and as a community each week as we gather. This is the story in which we as followers of Jesus discover the meaning of life. This is the story in which we discover our true identity. And this is the story in which we discover hope for humanity and hope for the world. And so each week we gather here to ground ourselves in that story, to remind each other of that story and our place in it, and to enter into it and to help each other get reoriented according to this grand narrative. So there's a million other narratives out there that would compete for our attention. There's a million other kingdoms that would compete for our allegiance. But we're here because God has rescued us, and he's called us unto himself to form a new humanity, which is to serve as a futuristic prototype of the new world that he's making. And so each Sunday this summer, we're taking a look at one of the classic Bible stories from the Old Testament, stories that are often either disregarded as primitive or obsolete or are truncated into moralistic fairy tales. But what we're trying to do this summer is to find the whole gospel in the whole Bible, to see how every story in this book points us to Jesus and his kingdom that has come and is still to come. And so, so far, we've covered the stories of Adam and Eve, of Cain and Abel, of Noah and his ark. Last week, Dr. Choi was with us from Beaverton and spoke on the story of Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 50. And today, in Exodus 14, we come to the story of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. So my staff told me that it's hot, and I only get 2,500 words today, so we're going to dive right in. Let me reintroduce you to the person of Moses, who, by the way, I think is one of the coolest characters in the Bible, which is why I named my son after him. And uh, Moses is an Israelite, meaning he is a member of this family that God has called and chosen to be his vehicle to carry out his rescue mission in the world. And uh, as an Israelite, Moses was born at a time when the nation of Israel was being held captive in slavery in Egypt. And so Moses was born as an Israelite in ancient Egypt. Egypt. And uh, at the time, the Egyptians, and specifically their king, the Pharaoh, was beginning to perceive this growing nation uh, as more and more of a threat. The Israelites were increasing in number and in power, and they were beginning to organize, and Pharaoh was fearful that eventually there would be a major slave revolt. And so one of the measures that he put into place to try to prevent this kind of revolt was the infanticide of every young Israelite boy. And so these 
uh, this time in which Moses was born was in the middle of that. And Moses' mother, when baby Moses came into the world, couldn't bear to throw her son in the river as was commanded by Pharaoh. So she did put him in the river, but in a basket, as we know, or more literally, an ark, which starts to help us connect this story to the bigger story that we've been in. And so this basket containing baby Moses is floating down the river, and it's discovered by this young Egyptian woman who happens to be the daughter of Pharaoh. And so she rescues this little uh, Israel, Israelite baby, and she takes him into her home. She adopts him, and all of a sudden, the most unlikely scenario, this slave baby overnight becomes the adopted grandson of the king of Egypt. And he grows up, Moses grows up in Pharaoh's palace and literally lives like a prince, at least for the first 40 years of his life. And that's when the story takes a twist because one day, as Moses is out walking through the kingdom, he observes an Egyptian beating an Israelite man. And something within Moses at that age of 40 just begins to churn in him. And it's probably an event that he's witnessed multiple times. Slave masters beating slaves. But for whatever reason that day, something exploded within him. And he reacted out of anger and vengeance. And he went on to kill that Egyptian. Which of course then made... Pharaoh, very angry, and put him at odds with his adopted Israelite grandson. And so Moses is forced then to flee. He leaves Egypt. He goes off to this remote place called Midian, where he gets married, and he goes to work as a shepherd, tending the flocks of his new father-in-law. And this is what he does for the next 40 years. So we'll just pause and think about this guy's story for a moment. Think about what he's been through. That he lived the first half of his life literally as a prince in the house of his people's oppressor. Likely was despised both by the Israelites as a traitor, but also by the Egyptians as somebody who had inherited much wealth of their kingdom. But now, he's an 80-year-old shepherd in Midian, working for his father-in-law. 80-year-old men, patriarchs, don't work as shepherds. This is a fully grown man pumping gas at his father-in-law's gas station. And then, something happens. One day, Moses is out watching the flocks in the wilderness, and he comes across this bush that's burning but not burning up. And it gets his attention, and he's drawn to it. And as he gets closer, Moses hears a voice speaking to him out of that bush, bush and he realizes that he is hearing the voice of God. By the way, if you uh, remember that movie, The Prince of Egypt? It's about 20 years old now, the DreamWorks animated film starring Val Kilmer as the voice of Moses. Um, do you remember this scene in that movie? I don't know if you do. But I read uh, recently an interview with the sound designer on The Prince of Egypt whose task was to figure out what the voice of God should sound like in the film. How would you make the voice of God sound? So this guy tried a bunch of different things. He tried mixing together like a thousand different human voices, thinking maybe that would form the voice of God. He thought about going the classic route and finding a James Earl Jones or somebody like that. What does the voice of God sound like? If you were in charge of trying to cast that role, who would you cast? Is it a big, booming voice from heaven? <laughs> It's always Morgan Freeman. Or is it a still, small voice? Um, here's what the sound designer decided to do. 
he reached out to a group of Bible scholars and theologians, Christian and Jewish, and he invites them into this process of trying to creatively decide when Moses hears the voice of God, what does that voice sound like? And they came up with the most brilliant solution. If you go back and watch this scene, the burning bush scene in the Prince of Egypt movie, when Moses hears God's voice, it's the voice of Val Kilmer. Moses, or God, speaks to Moses in Moses' own voice. Go back and watch it. It's pretty brilliant. Because I know that for many of us, this is what we found to be true in our walk with God, that most of the time as followers of Jesus, when we discern the voice of God in our lives, it doesn't often sound like Morgan Freeman or Charlton Heston. Most of the time, it's like it almost sounds like it's coming from us. Most of the time, God speaks to us through our own thoughts, through our own desires, through our own dreams. And the process of growing and maturing in our faith as followers of Jesus is learning to recognize and to trust that voice. Believing again that we're united with Jesus, that we're filled with his spirit, that he's given us a new regenerate heart upon which he has written his law. So it's tricky and it takes some practice. And I recommend we learn to do it in the context of community that can help us. But the idea is that the longer we walk with God, the less his voice sounds like that of a stranger's speaking from the heavens. And the more he sounds like the disclosure of the deepest desires of our souls. Or maybe he does sound like Val Kilmer. I'm not really sure, but it's a pretty cool idea. So Moses is out there in the desert. This bush is speaking to him. He hears God's voice. And this is what God says in Exodus chapter 3. Listen to the word of God. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. So I am concerned about their suffering. He moves on and says, The cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, Moses, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. God says to Moses, This burnt out, secluded, 80-year-old shepherd pumping gas in the wilderness. You may have escaped from Egypt and the discomfort of life in oppression. And you may have found this new, secluded, uncomplicated life in the desert. But God says, I haven't forgotten about my people back in Egypt. I haven't forgotten about my children who are enslaved and I'm not going to ignore their suffering. I am going to set them free, Moses, and I want you to help me. And here we begin to understand why it is that the story of Moses in the story of Exodus has been so significant to the African-American church tradition. The Exodus reveals the character of God. Don't miss this. When we read a story like this amongst all the other questions that our minds want to ask, first and foremost, when we come to the scriptures, we're asking the Spirit to show us through the text what is God wanting to reveal about himself to his people in these stories. And what this story in Exodus shows us about what God is really like is that he is a God who will not ignore the cries of the oppressed. And so when African people who were slaves in our country came across this story, the story of Exodus, Exodus, 
It was not a stretch for them to apply it to their lives. They did not need to allegorize it or spiritualize it. They didn't need to figure out how the metaphor applied to them. They heard the God of Moses saying, I have heard you crying out because of your slave drivers, and I am concerned about your suffering. So the story of Moses reveals a God who hears the cries of the oppressed and will not ignore them, a God who is faithful to deliver his people out of slavery. This story becomes foundational in the tradition of the African-American church. And it wasn't just the slaves that realized this. Has anybody been to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C.? I don't see anybody. I haven't either. And I would love to go. Last year, they had a really interesting exhibition in which they displayed one of the only three known remaining copies of what's become known as the Slave Bible. The Slave Bible, it's officially entitled Select Parts of the Holy Bible for the Use of the Negro Slaves in the British West India Islands. You can just call it the Slave Bible. It was an edition of the Christian Bible that was published by British Christian missionaries who were seeking to convert African slaves in the Caribbean islands. And so what they did is took this Bible and they began to cut pages out of it that would portray the heart of God for the oppressed. They began to cut out stories and entire sections, anything that if it got into the hands of an enslaved person would cause them to think that the God of the Bible had any problem with that situation or had any hope for their delivery. And do you know what they were left with? Not much. Almost the entire Old Testament was done away with, along with a whole bunch of chunks in the New Testament, like Galatians 3, for example, which says there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Slave Bible also got rid of the entire book of Revelation, which in the end, gives a vision for a new heavens and a new earth, a new world that God is making in which Jesus is king and justice is done and evil is punished and a new humanity occupies the world. These British missionaries didn't want these African slaves getting the idea that somehow there was a hope for justice or deliverance. And so the slave Bible doesn't include Moses hearing God's heart and God's voice for the oppressed and God's promise to deliver them to the freedom. Interesting, the slave Bible does include the passage we looked at last week of Joseph's enslavement in Egypt, which Dr. Choi looked at with us. The white slaveholders and missionaries thought that Joseph served as a good example of someone who was oppressed but simply accepted their lot in life, kept faith in God, and then in the end was rewarded for it. That part was in the slave Bible, but the entire Exodus was cut because it's so clear, because it's so obvious if you come to this book and want to know how does God feel about evil and injustice and oppression The story of Moses clearly reveals a God who hears the cry of the oppressed and promises to set his people free. So we would do well for those of us who are dominant culture Christians to listen, to pay close attention to our brothers and sisters of color and to learn how to hear the story of the Bible through their ears. It'll come to life in whole new ways. And so God says to Moses, I haven't forgotten about my people who are in slavery. I'm not going to ignore their suffering any longer. I'm going to set them free, and I want you to help me. How does Moses respond then? Me? You want me to help you? You want me to go back to Egypt 
where my crazy father-in-law wants to kill me, where all my people despise me? You want me to go and to stand up to the Pharaoh and just kind of ask him nicely to let maybe two million Israelite slaves just go? Economically, that would be a, uh, a difficult situation for Egypt. You want me to go? Who am I? How, why would you choose me? And the argument goes on and on. Moses continues to argue with God, and eventually, after much pleading, whining, complaining, he decides to trust God, and he goes back to Egypt. And then over the next few chapters, he begins bargaining with Pharaoh to set the Israelites free. Every time Pharaoh makes this false promise, God then sends a plague. And finally then, Pharaoh decides to let the slaves go. And for a few days, everything is great. But then they reach the, ban Red reach the banks of the Red Sea, and they're trapped. And we're just going to focus in for the rest of our time on these couple verses, starting in verse 10 of Exodus 14. Exodus 14, 10, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So here's where we begin to see that there's another layer to this story. Here's where we start to understand just how deeply traumatized these people are. Right? I mean, think about it. They've been living as a nation under horrible slavery and oppression for 400 years. These people have never experienced life outside. They've never left Egypt before. They've never really had to make any decisions. All their decisions as slaves have been made for them. And now they're out here in the wilderness. They overcome, they, they come up to their first obstacle. And their first instinct is... Let's go back. Wasn't it better back there in Egypt? You start to see how traumatized they may be. They've got some Stockholm Syndrome going on. I mean, and not just slavery, but the infanticide of all the male children. Every single family likely has suffered the loss of a baby or two. These are people who have suffered terribly. They finally find liberation out of Egypt, and at the first obstacle they face, their instinct is to turn around and to go back to slavery. So yes, technically, the Israelites have been set free from slavery. They're out of Egypt. But obviously, they're still not totally free. Tim Keller puts it like this. To take a person out of slavery takes an instant. To take the slavery out of a person takes a process. So when they start saying things like, Egypt actually wasn't that bad. We kind of liked it there. It wasn't perfect, but we should go back. Many of us will begin to recognize this as the language of addiction. The irrational, delusional self-talk that secretly enjoys being addicted, that got so used to being, <clears throat> to the comfort and the familiarity of addiction that even in the opportunity of freedom, there's this draw, this compulsion to go back. And so here we begin to recognize ourselves in this story in another way. In addition to needing to be set free from the literal bondage of slavery, humans also need to be set free from emotional, psychological, psychological and spiritual slavery. In the world of addiction, they say, 
that everyone is an addict of some kind, and you're either in recovery or denial. We're all either in recovery or denial. I don't know about you, but even though I've never literally been a slave, I'm very familiar with the experience of being enslaved, of feeling imprisoned, powerless, trapped, stuck, and addicted. And for me, addiction can take the form of external things, addicted to food, to my phone, to TV, to alcohol, to nicotine, whatever it is, these external things. And it can also take the form of internal things, addictions to comfort, laziness, people-pleasing, passivity, perfectionism. And I don't know what it is for you, but either you're in recovery or denial. I'm checking my app, which tells me it's been 394 days since I've had a drink of alcohol. Which, you know how you have to multiply dog years by seven? In Bend, beer years are also multiplied by seven. <clears throat> we are all an addict of some kind. To the external, to the internal, and likely to a pretty gnarly combination of several things. This is exactly what Paul, the great apostle Paul, is talking about in Romans chapter 7, where he says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. And listen how he talks about this. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And as it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Paul is describing what we might call the normative Christian experience. This is going to be very familiar to those of us who are seeking to follow Jesus, but continue to get caught up in patterns of destruction and self-righteousness, and sin, and addiction. So Keller goes on to say that not all addictions are sin, but all sins are addictions. And so in this Exodus story, we see God's heart for the poor, for the oppressed, for the enslaved in the most literal way, but we also see that not only do we need to be delivered from slavery, not only do we need to be taken out of slavery, but the slavery needs to be taken out of us. And if you think about these Israelites, if you think about Moses trying to respond to that level of collective anxiety, of two million people saying, why did we ever follow you? We want to go back. Here's how Moses responds. Exodus 14, 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I want to say that one more time, and I want you to listen for the voice of God to you today. Wherever those places are in your life, in which you feel enslaved, trapped, hopeless, powerless, addicted. As you stand in the desert, 
admitting your trauma, your brokenness, your vulnerability, and your sin. What is it that God would say to you today? Listen to his words again to you. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The enemies you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. In closing, I think it's important in conversations like this to understand that there's a difference between sins and wounds. And we often get sins and wounds confused for one another. Sins are rebellious places in our hearts that need repentance. And wounds are tender places in our hearts that need healing. You can't repent of wounds and you can't get therapy for sins. And different versions of Christianity would be prone to push everything into one category or the other. To put everything in the sin category or to put everything in the wound category. But both of those are far too simplistic to address what's really going on in the human soul. The gospel which we proclaim, the story about the Jesus who has come to us and is on a mission to make all things new, including us, is, is the answer for addressing the full complexity of human personhood. That we need to be reconciled both to God and to ourselves. So in short, we need a new Moses, a true Moses, an ultimate Moses. I don't have time this morning, but it's fascinating to think through all the parallels between the story of Moses and the story of Jesus. From their birth to their life, their ministry, their calling, what we see over and over is that the New Testament writers want to present Jesus as this new Moses, this liberating king who has come to set captives free, who will not ignore the cries of the oppressed, who is on a mission, yes, to get his people out of slavery, but also get, to get the slavery out of us. And so the invitation again to you this morning, don't be afraid that God is with you. He is faithful. And he has sent his son, Jesus, as a liberating king to set you free. The first thing we see the Israelites do on the other side of the Red Sea is they worship. In Exodus 15, they write songs, songs of praise, songs of celebration, songs of gratitude. And that's the invitation for us this morning. So Father, we thank you so much that you have not given up on this world, that you have entered into it by sending your son Jesus, the true and liberating king. Lord Jesus, we pray for freedom and justice for the oppressed in our country and in our world today. And we also pray that you would set us free from the places of bondage in our own lives and hearts. We don't know all the answers or all the solutions or all the steps to take, but we know that it starts by coming to you, confessing you, and receiving life from you. So we trust you, Jesus, and we look to you and you alone. Amen.